Now, the moment we've all been waiting for, let's welcome our amazing panel. They're handsome, they're gentlemen, and they are right, quite rambunctious tonight, might I say. So let's give a big hand of applause for our panel tonight. I said we got to talk loud because there's a lot of people in this room. Oh. I love you too. Hi guys. I love you, John. Thanks, man. <laughs> all right, I just want to make sure uh, you guys know who, everybody who's up here tonight. I mean, Hi, Mom. They're all so handsome. <laughs> know their names. Literally, Nat's mom. Not a joke. Oh, yeah, how's it going? My mom's out there too. Hey, Nat's mom. Guys, you know, you may know this man sitting next to me. Uh, his name is John Green. <laughs> He just likes to hang out and make videos, you know. He also happens to be a New York Times best-selling author and the executive producer of the Paper Towns movie. Next to him, we have Jake Schreier, the brilliant director of Paper Towns. <laughs> then we have Michael H. Weber, the screenwriter for Paper Towns. <laughs> We have Nat. Hey, Nat. Yes. Nat Wolf, everybody, and then we have Justice Smith. Woo! Oh! Oh! And last, but certainly not least, Ryan Lott, the composer for Paper Town. Guys, I've been watching you backstage, and you just seem like you are such good friends. Like, hanging out is, with you is the best time ever. Acting. Oh, acting, yeah. <laughs> You're yeah, very good all actors. Fake. Sorry. Uh, my first question is for John. <laughs> no, we really are friends. You really yeah. are. But really, more actors. More actors. No, there. A lot of times there. you do one of these movies, and then you go do all these interviews for the movie, and, um, and you have to say that you liked everybody a lot, and you don't like everybody a lot. <laughs> And in this one, we get to tell the truth. We really did love each other, and we all became a family. I don't really know Ryan that well. But besides <laughs> that, <laughs> but Ryan seems like a good guy from what I've seen. So. <laughs> Justice and Nat live together. Yeah, we basically, yeah. yeah, Justice and I live together, so. You guys really? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's all that. That's yeah. it. Let's That's it. Moving That's on. So, okay. All right. Uh, John, you're a guy That's who all. wears so many hats. You're a vlogger, you're an author, you're an executive producer. Uh, how was filming Paper Towns different, or maybe perhaps the same, than The Fault in Our Stars? Um, that's a great question. It was, it was different just because like, the story's so different. You know, like, uh, Fault in Our Stars is pretty sad. Um, <laughs> There's definitely less cancer in Paper Towns. Yeah, uh, it was just like, so it was a very... I mean, it was a lovely place to be, to go every morning to the Fault in Our Stars set, and it felt wonderful to see this story come alive, but it was also extremely sad. Yeah. Every day, relentlessly, <laughs> physically painful sadness. And this was very different, you know, like, um, the, the movie um, is, it has sad moments, but it also has romantic moments and funny moments, and it's a mystery, and there's just a lot other, of other stuff happening. And so it was a very different kind of place to be every day. Yes. It was a much, like, there was so much laughter, and, like, I genuinely, like, I just love watching Justice and Nat talk to each other. Like, that's really all I was doing backstage was, like, I was a little annoyed with them because they're, you know, like, children. <laughs> But they're your children. Yeah, they have, but you also love them because they're your children. Yeah, right. Exactly. I'm just kidding. I love you guys. <laughs> um, I've noticed a few differences in the trailer than the book. And of course, you can never keep the movie the same as it is in the book. This is a question for Matt. How do you decide when you're writing the screenplay? There's no one named Matt. No, <laughs> Michael. I'm I thought sorry. you said Matt. Michael. I was like, yeah, I was like, Matt. So I did not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right, though. He looks like a Matt. There's a Matt. No, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. This is a question for Michael. How do you decide what needs to be changed when you're writing the screenplay? You know, you can never use the entire book. It would be a seven hour movie. So yeah. you have to make choices that preserve the spirit of the book. 
and, and we knew you, John, now already off of Fault and our stars. So uh, it, we had you as a resource. I think we talked to you a lot more this time around uh, as we made strategic uh, changes that are hopefully uh, for the better for the movie. Um, but it's tricky, it's a balancing act, and it's why you never quite nail it on the first try, and it's a process. And as more people like Jake, everyone comes on board, uh, it keeps evolving and hopefully keeps getting better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think people tend to get hung up on little details you know, from the book, but really the main thing that I think everybody tried to get from the book was the feeling that you get from reading the book. We try to give that feeling to you when you watch the movie. You know? So I think that was more important to us than like, you know, like in getting fault, every wasn't getting every little yeah. detail. Yeah. yeah. John, how involved are you in the screenwriting process? Have you ever looked at a scene that changed a little bit of something from the book and thought, ooh, I'm not sure how I feel about that? Uh, I think I'm probably more likely to tell you guys to make stuff less like the book than more like That's the book. That's true. Um, yeah, so I'm, 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 I don't feel that, I don't feel an ownership of the book, I guess. I just want it to be a good story, and I want, I'm more concerned with like capturing the themes like Nat said, like capturing, holding on to the things in the story that um, I think are important to readers, and then like the idea. I mean, in this, in this, it's really hard to make a movie um, to have like a Hollywood studio make a movie about how bad young men are at imagining young women and how um, you know girls. Um, a lot of times, like we do, girls a disservice by trying to put them on a pedestal or by romanticizing them. Um, and they did it. <laughs> but we like to be romanticized sometimes. sometimes. Well, I mean, I think sometimes like people play, you, you, I, but I think you should be allowed to be able to play with that without having people treat you like an object or people dehumanize you in that process. Like you should be allowed to experience that. So like that's, that, uh, that idea is the idea that was most important to us um, to preserve. And I, I thought Scott and Mike did a great job of that. Um, it was certainly what inspired all of us, I think, about Kara's audition, that she understands that very profoundly, what it's like to be treated as a two-dimensional image. Um, she understands that better than anybody I've ever met. So that's what we, that was like the number one thing. So everything for me was in service think, of that. I think also friendship, true friendship. Yeah, and what, like, what friendship really is, and, and that's something that Q doesn't know when he starts out. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't really know or how important it is. He doesn't know what he has in his friends. But yeah. we get him there. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly you. Mostly you. Jake, let's talk about this amazing cast that you've assembled. And we have Nat and Justice with here tonight. What were you looking for? Woo! Yeah, they're hot, right? There you go. Hi. <laughs> uh, what were you looking for when you assembled the major characters of the movie? Um, I just think people who could be honest to the character. I mean, there's a lot of different tones and there's almost like different genres within one movie. It has to be funny and it also has to be heartfelt. And I think, you know, we just lucked out. I think the cast is absolutely incredible. I mean, I cannot wait for you guys to see these guys in this movie. And I mean, it was something that you mentioned that happened on set. Almost everyone just sort of fell into their character mm -hmm. on set and the, the line between when we were shooting a scene or when they were just hanging out in between one or back at the, the the apartments, like everyone fell so neatly into the dynamics that were there. And as John said, the way Kara could understand the characters, I think, I mean, mostly you're just looking for people who are good, who are great actors, and I think all six of them are just incredible. In this movie. But yeah, they all raised, I felt like they, you know, I saw the novel through Q's eyes, and I felt like, especially Halston and Jazz and um, Kara, Sorry, guys. Just all the people that aren't here. Hey, oh, and also Austin, who plays Ben in the movie, and um, some of the Quinn's parents. Mom. <laughs> yeah. yeah, girls, girls, mom, yeah. Duck, girl, uh, mom, Jace, yeah. our star. Um, Becca. I felt like everybody other than that and um, <laughs> and Justice really, like, in a way, like taught me something about their characters. Um, <laughs> Wait, I, you know, one thing is that, I mean, Nat, I, Nat was attached to the movie before I came on to direct it, and, you know, one of the first things I went out and watched was, I don't know if you guys have seen this film, Palo Alto, that he's in, and completely amazing. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. And I was just thrilled, because it's such a different movie, and it's such a different part than Q is, and there's a way that Q could have been portrayed, I think, in the kind of less interesting version of our film that's very straight ahead, you know, and he's the guy who doesn't get the girl, and... I think we've seen that and to have someone like Nat with the amount of kind of energy that he has around it, it's such a different 
portrayal of that character. And I was, I mean, so I just got lucky from the start. And, and Nat was involved before we, uh, Scott and I came on board to write it. And yeah. your involvement working with you again was, it was a big part of why we wanted to be involved with Paper Thanks, Towns. Guys. Yeah. Nat, you were so fabulous in The Fault in Our Stars. I was a huge fan. Um, and now you're back as Q for Paper Towns. Uh, what is it about John's energy that just keeps you coming back for more? Well, I just want to quickly say, I mean, I love, I love Paper Towns probably the most of all John's books. And I'm a bigger John Green fan than any of you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but also, I just feel like I won the lottery getting to work with Mike again and Scott and getting to work with Jake, who is uh, just a brilliant director and really helped to, you know, the thing that he said about uh, on set we were a certain way and then off set we were a certain way, he kind of helped facilitate that. He was the leader and uh, we're so lucky to have had him steer the ship. Yes, and, uh, it's true. And, and Weber also did such an amazing job of taking a book that's so beloved, you know, you guys love it, he's going to cut so much from it that you guys are going to be upset about. <laughs> but at the same time, he made it the exact, I feel like you get the same experience that you got reading the book that you get seeing the movie. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just lucky to be the, the guy who's in the most scenes. You know? <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, so I did Fall in Our Stars, and then I was on set one day, and one of the producers came up to me, and he was like, you should read Paper Towns with this mischievous look. <laughs> and I read it, and I loved it. And then six months later, he called me and said, hey, do you want to play Quentin in Paper? I was like, yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I really have just been kind of obsessed uh, ever since. So, so what was the question? <laughs> that was a good answer. Yeah. What was your favorite part about playing Quentin? Um, my favorite part about playing Quentin was probably interacting with the rest of the, the, rest of the cast. You know, like we all got along so well, and it felt um, as real as it gets, you know, when you're making a movie. And, and uh, uh, you know, my favorite part was probably there's this guy who played Radar who's so handsome and so talented. <laughs> and I um, can't remember his name, but it was, um, yeah. No, Justice the truth Smith. is, though, that like Nat and Justice and Austin, who, who play Q and Radar and Ben in the movie, are <laughs> on screen like my dream come true for those three kids, like the way they, you can just tell watching it, the way they care about each other, the way they like take care of each other in the movie, but also like the, that, that extended outside of the movie, like that was so special to just like bear witness to. Um, that's something that I'll treasure forever. Uh, Justice, you're essentially a newcomer to the movie scene. I mean, I, I looked yeah. for cool facts about you online, and there's, you know, not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what is, true. You're right. true, it's true. Right. What is the center of Justice? Like, what makes you tick? What do you like? What's your, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Um, my favorite ice cream flavor is mint and chip. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up! <laughs> um, it's the best ice cream flavor. <laughs> uh, what was the other question? What do, you want, what do you want your fans to know about you that they don't know about you already? I want you to know that I just love mint and chip. Love <laughs> <laughs> dairy and um, <laughs> he's actually lactose intolerant. I mean, to keep him from eating cheese the whole movie. And he would sneak plates of nachos. I'd come into his apartment and be like, I wasn't eating this. <laughs> I love cheese. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so the first day of the, the shoot was the Black Santa's Day. Um, and uh, I guess, and um, I was really nervous about the whole movie, you know? Like, I don't know if it's going to be any good. I didn't know this guy. He just had a lot of nervous energy. I didn't know if you were probably going to fail. Yeah, I figured it was That's probably going to fail. Yeah. But then I walked in. First off, you walk into this room, and there's a lot of, lot of black Santas in that house. <laughs> um, and it makes you start to imagine Santa more complexly, which is my intention. <laughs> and um, so the first take, like before um, I sat down, I was super nervous. And like before, uh, like right when he says action, but before like stuff starts to happen, Justice had to do some stuff before um, his girlfriend calls. And so he was like leaning over and he was doing actual chemistry, like actual high school chemistry, like just for fun. <laughs> and I was like, oh, he's the guy. <laughs> We're going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs>
You want me to elaborate on that? No, you don't have to. Hey, Ryan. Hey. You're so far away from me. Um, I want to know uh, if you know the date of when the soundtrack is going to come out. When is the soundtrack going to come out, Ryan? <laughs> you flustered. That's a fantastic question that I know. June 16th. And the answer is June 16th. <laughs> Great. So you heard it here first. The soundtrack will come out June 16th. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Uh, Ryan, in an interview that you did uh, with MTV, you described the musical theme for Margot's character, character as whimsical with a touch of melancholy and adventure. I'm curious as to how you really got to the core of Margot's character to accurate, accurate, and, and other characters in the movie as well, to accurately portray them musically. Did you read the book a hundred times? Like, how did that process work really? for you? Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's really tricky. I didn't read the book first because I feel like a successful adaptation, which I think this is, exists um, on its own as a film, and and um, and that was my job was to score the film. Um, so I only had like sneak peeks originally of the of uh, of the film, and uh, I started scoring right away to that. So um, and I only I only saw a rough cut, um, but right away I feel like the performances were so strong, the chemistry between the characters was so strong. Um, I honestly launched right in, and I, and I didn't, I didn't, there wasn't really a discovery period. I feel like I got it, you know. Um, Margot's theme is, is uh, yeah, it's whimsical, it's got some adventure, it shoots up, but ult ultimately it um, takes a direction and toward the melancholy. And um, I think that's how she reads, uh, reads to me. Mm -hmm. I heard that you use uh, baking sheets to create some mm -hmm. of the sounds for the movies. What other uh, unusual items will make cameos in the score? Uh, yeah, one, I mean, one of the things I love to do is um, kind of make my own instruments from, from uh, maybe unusual sound sources. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to uh, traditional stuff, string orchestra and harp and drums and guitar and bass and stuff like that, synths, um, I did, uh, I did find uh, interesting sound sources in things like, um, like bowing a piano string, but using oh, like wow. dental floss, you can like Ooh. bow this, the strings on the inside of a piano, things like that, or, or wine glasses, like tuned to different pitches, and um, you can do similar articulations that you do on strings, you can do actually on wine glasses. If you go into Ryan's studio, there's just like a lot of pots and pans everywhere. There, and there's, <laughs> so, there's a lot of metal. Do you like cook afterwards? You like to no, <laughs> actually, I'm a terrible. My wife is an amazing cook, so I've uh, it's stunted my growth as a chef. <laughs> Michael, so many fans felt that the Fault in Our Stars last year was pretty true to the tone of the book. Uh, you know, John's words are so eloquent and honest, and they played a true leading role in that film all the way right to the end. Um, where uh, where did you get started when you started the screenplay for Paper Towns? This one was a lot trickier, uh, so thank you, John. Sorry. Uh, no, I don't know anything about movies. <laughs> it, um, we, we literally and figuratively take apart the book uh, and, and just almost study the different parts of it. And then, when you say literally, do you, you, mean you, do you rip you it apart? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we have, a, we have a, no, no, not of the. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we we have a uh, <laughs> we have you're a off the, you're off the looking for Alaska movie you're out it's too late <laughs> I know it is too late you wrote a really good script go on uh, we took apart that one too um, no we get a, a a print up of the book eventually to to write all oh over. so you don't even buy your copy <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's awesome no. yeah well, you gotta give me eighty cents when we go backstage <laughs> times three. <laughs> yeah, 240. Uh, we, t we take apart the book and write all over it. And um, it, in the case of Paper Towns, it's, um, there's almost a few different genres in, in one book. Um, uh, and, and for us, it was finding the right balance of those different parts. How long should the road trip be uh, screen-wise time? Uh, how long should the search for Margot be? So. Uh, there was a lot of trial and error as we sort of played with the levels until it felt 
right, and it f totally felt satisfying uh, because we're, Scott and I, we're fans first, and we want it to resemble the experience of the book. Mm -hmm. Were you, Jake and John, making changes up until the last second? Would you do a scene and say, mm, maybe this is not right, and try it again? I don't, I don't know, like, entire scenes, but you're always tinkering. You're always playing with uh, 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 lines and moments, and um, I, th th I think the framework was pretty much in place once we started shooting, but we were, you know, always sort of tweaking little things. Well, yeah, and I mean, that's one of the great things about having John on set, and I mean, I guess you could imagine an author, I mean, like you said before, like, just looking for the stuff that, is that like the book, is that not? He just wants it to be a great movie, you know? I mean, I think that what's so great about Scott and Mike's script, you know, I, I read the book, you know, a year and a half ago when, when they sent it to me and then got to read the script, and I just thought they did such an amazing job, like, we're handicapped. I mean, John has this amazing, amazing voice as a writer, and we can't just put all the words in the movie. That would be a great movie, but we're, we have to approach it differently. And the structure that they found to capture what it was about was incredible. And then you're there on set, and all John wants is just, could it be funnier? And these guys, I mean, there are scenes when it was appropriate where, I mean, I think the Bettina scene is almost entirely improvised. And yeah, the, if you, know, you just met like, Justice and Austin and that be funny. I mean, a lot of times, I, yeah. They're just, they're funny. So it's kind of, that part was really easy. You could just be like, I don't know. I don't know. Jake directed the movie. That part was easy. I would tell Jake, Jake, let them be funny. Speaking of Was it easy? Was that, yeah. It's so easy. It's a simple process. I found directing you know, like, this movie to be not that stressful at all. Speaking of another funny actor from the show, I heard, John, that you had a role in Paper Town, I mean, yeah. in The Fault in Our Stars that got cut. I did. Jake, can you... Thanks for bringing that up, Ken. I hadn't thought about I'm that all day. So, so I'm really, I'm very sorry. Jake, uh, can you confirm that John... I think I can role? now officially confirm that John Green will be in the film. I am? Oh! Oh! Thank you. Give us a hug. Come on. Thank you, that's so nice. Thanks, man. You have to look very hard, but he's in the film. To keep your ears open. As his acting coach, I'd yeah. like 10%. <laughs> this is a huge moment. What'd you say? I said, as your acting coach, I said a not funny joke that I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, great. Oh, yeah. That is my acting coach. Uh, he coached my acting on The Fault in Our Stars. He did okay. a terrible job. Yeah, can't, I mean, can't get blood from a stone. You got cut, so. <laughs> I was really bad. Uh, <laughs> The director of that film, after my best take, paused for a moment and said, and I'm quoting him directly, I think that was usable. <laughs> um, but uh, I really, in the mean, Nat and I, and, and also Austin and, and Justice and Halston, I got some tips from Jazz. I really reached out very broadly for this part. Daniel Day-Lewis actually came down to the set. And helped <laughs> yeah, I had Daniel Day-Lewis yeah. come down and yeah. try to give me a method acting tutorial. And I really, um, yeah. I got really deep into my character. And I feel like I delivered a usable performance. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so usable that we used it. I know, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> Do you even know what my part is? You were there. Me? I yeah. actually don't. Yeah. yeah. I, by I the way, I don't know, know who I am. I know I what it is. You talked to me. Right I don't either. What I don't know. I talked to you. We were hanging out. Yeah. That we were hanging out. Yeah. You're like, I'm about to do this. <laughs> I was like, that's cool. And then I came back afterwards, like drenched in sweat. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Acting. Wait, wait. <laughs> Torture. I, I definitely know the part. Obviously. Yeah. How did it make you drenched in sweat? <laughs> oh, just because I was so worked up. Sorry, what part is it? Wait, I thought I was going to have it's so part. minor. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... <laughs> hey, stay more. away from my actors, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Very fragile. It is pretty... It's there pretty are no small parts. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can I just say, you improvised almost the entirety of your part, and it was great. You were really good at it, genuinely. He was excellent. You have to listen very closely for the movie. He's great. <laughs> Jake, should I not trust you anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Be nice. I do think it's funny that I knew you were in it before you knew you were in it. Yeah, well, I, well, I was in the version that I saw, yeah. but then afterwards, like, in the, in the discussions right. about it, like, with like the, how can we remove people? this? No, they literally mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. They're like, is it going to be, is it weird? 
is it, does it, is it working? And I was like, I think it's working. I think it's working really well. <laughs> That's why you got to have the DP credit, you know. So you yeah, it. yeah, yeah. So you can lean forward and say like, oh, it's good. It's good. It, no, it's totally. What helped computer. was when you're in your scene, when the tear rolls down your cheek. Yeah. I put like lots of lush strings under nice. there. Nice, thanks, man. Yeah. Some pots and pans. Yeah. Uh, a lot of wine glasses. Some pots and pans. <laughs> John, uh, when I was reading Paper Towns for the second time, as I'm sure many people here have, who's read it more than once? Thank yeah. you, guys. Nice. And thank um, you. Thank you for reading it twice. Oh, That's of so course. Cool. <laughs> um, some of yeah. Q's opening lines about Margot being his miracle hit me a little bit harder, and it plays a big part in the original trailer mm -hmm. as well. And they actually kind of made me mad, because after knowing the story, uh, there are times in the novel when I hate Margot. Oh, yeah. I feel like she's taking advantage, you know, of the soft, sensitive, unassuming Q. Well, but he's taking advantage of her. <laughs> Did you intend for Q's miracle to be highly interpretive, or is there a very specific takeaway that you want readers and moviegoers to digest about the word miracle? That's a great question. I mean, I guess the main thing is that I think when you watch the actual movie, um, you see that, you know, Q's miracle isn't Margot, and, and treating a person as a miracle instead of as a person is, is always a mistake. I mean, I do think that you're right that at times Margot is unfair to Q, but I think it's unfair to, to Margot to ask her to be uh, all of these things at once to him, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to live up to all these expectations that, that he's built. In the audition, when Carr auditioned, there was, uh, she was auditioning with Nat, I don't know, the one I saw, and I don't know, I feel bad, but I didn't know who Carl was. Like, I, just, I didn't know that she was famous or whatever. Um, <laughs> and, um, but there was this incredibly powerful moment where, and it's in the book, uh, I think. Um, <laughs> it's been a while. You should check it out, John, it's good. <laughs> yeah, is it good? Yeah. yeah. Does it hold up? It's now a major motion picture. <laughs> <laughs> There's a moment where, um, where Q says, I love you, and, and Marvin's like, what? You don't even know me. Like, we've spent, like, three days together in the last nine years. And, like, because we've been seeing the story in Q's perspective the whole time, like, it seems sort of reasonable to us that he would love her. But, in fact, like, if you zoom out, like, you can't know someone after three days in, in nine years. And, um, and there's, so I think she says, like, you don't love me. You don't know me. And the way Kara said that, and, I mean, like, it choked me up because it was... Uh, yeah, I mean, it said something about the way that I'd imagined, I, I'd imagined girls when I was a teenager and, and the way that it had been kind of destructive to me and destructive to them. So yeah. I think in the end, like, what Q realizes is that his miracle um, uh, is, is, is more complicated and that yeah. it's not a person that people are people. The only thing I was going to say about the miracle thing is that the way I thought about it as Quentin was, like, the miracle ended up com in a convoluted way being Margot because she taught him to not you know, that the grass isn't always greener on the other side, you know, to kind of look at the things that are around you. I mean, I think that's what I got, you know, in my character, you know, I got was like that the whole movie, you know, you're searching for something and you don't realize the thing you're really searching for is right next to you, you know, which is a common problem, especially of teenagers, I think. Yeah, and that like you, romantic love is not the only love that has value. I mean, you know, like it, that. In the end, no spoilers, but like, <laughs> you know, Q ends up with radar, as he should. <laughs> That's the way it should be. Nat, speaking of uh, romantic relationships, oh, God. you as Nat and not <laughs> you as Q, could you date a girl like Margot Roth Spiegelman? Um, well, I think the thing about the thing in the movie is like, for the first half of the movie, he thinks he's going to date this, this girl. He doesn't really know her. I mean, I guess I could date, uh, well, I guess he hasn't seen the movie, but neither have I, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but, but even in the book, you know, I guess I could probably, you know, I could date the girl at the end of the book that, that I know, uh, you know, better, maybe some, you know, down the line. But, but in that night out, I don't think either of them really totally know each other. Uh, one of my favorite clips that, we have, that I've seen so far from the movie is the scene where Q uh, covers Chuck's eyebrow in Nair uh, with, uh, with Margot, and they make a mad dash to the car, and Margot says to him, uh, I'm so proud of you for releasing your inner ninja. So uh, let me ask you guys, this is for everybody, um, have you ever considered breaking and entering? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's good, Brian. Depend, depends on how badly I have to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> or have you ever assumed the role of a ninja? Justice, I'm looking at you. I think you have. Um, <laughs> there's the, the Today? The Do you mean today? Oh, the BB yeah. gun. Please don't tell that story. <laughs> I don't know how many times <laughs> I have to tell John you not Green, to tell that John story. Green. <laughs> Came, came into work, work one, one day. day. Justice does this thing where he says what I say while I say it. It's really cool. He's great at it. Came, came into, into work, work one, one day and said, said that uh, he wasn't was able to sleep because, because there was a light outside, outside of his window, window keeping him up. So instead of buying him blackout curtains, we bought him, or we bought, no, we bought a BB gun <laughs> and we tried to shoot out the light. light. We got uh, filmed, filmed on video, video and, and kicked out of our apartment complex <laughs> until the until producer the Isaac, Isaac begged them for us to stay, stay and we were able to stay till the end of production. production. <laughs> <laughs> Justice, when you do that, it's like actual magic. Yeah. Like, it's like you're actually reading someone's mind. It's so creepy. No. And then I try to do it with, with him, and he'll look at me and speak very slowly, and I'll be like three seconds behind. <laughs> and I'll be like, BB gun. <laughs> but yeah, don't buy guns. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, yeah. you're a musician in real life, you know, aside from a composer. Um, how, was, how is composing a film score different than, say, writing an album? Uh, well, writing um, for film is just that. You're writing in service of the picture and the story. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit more of an ego trip when you can make an album and just follow your own whims. Um, but in a way, film in, in some ways is more rewarding because you're part of something bigger and you sort of discover things about yourself and ev your, even your own creative urges when you uh, put them to work in service of something. And um, if it's something that you really enjoy and you really believe in, uh, I think that is especially true. I have some questions, and I'm just going to rapid fire. Anybody can answer them. Do you predict the term honey buddies will go into rotation with other phrases, such as on fleek, ratchet, and by Felicia? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what was the last one? By Felicia. By Felicia. Felicia from uh, Friday? I don't know. <laughs> First off, have you seen Friday, the greatest movie ever made? Oh. This, other than Die Hard 4, the second best film behind <laughs> Die Hard 4. Um, you've never seen Friday? No. I oh my God. Well, I know what we're doing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Call your wife, you've got plans. <laughs> uh, do you guys expect the sale of Black Santas to spike this holiday season? Yeah. yeah. I hope so. So tired of Santa being wrongly white. <laughs> It's from Egypt. <laughs> Early in the book, Q reveals. <laughs> True. He's based on Saint Nicholas of Myra, who's Turkish, but like part, part his heritage partly Egyptian. It's ridiculous. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> you brought up a sore topic. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I just love Black Santa. Me too. Yeah. Uh, early, in, early in the book, Q reveals that as a kid, he wanted to invent something called the Ringolator, which is a machine that shoots colorful rocks into the sky to give the Earth the same mm -hmm. sort of colorful rings that Saturn has. I had forgotten about this. What <laughs> invention <laughs> do you guys want to invent? Oh, I can't wait for this the Ringolator scene. In this the has to be justice. Yeah. Um, what, what invention I want to invent? Is yeah. that the question? Anybody um, have any good ideas? Anybody can answer. Um, Nobody from the patent office is here, right? Yeah. I want to invent a machine <laughs> that can... Feels like you're making stuff <laughs> as you go along. <laughs> no, I ha I've had this plan for years. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to make a machine that can solve the crisis of maybe the aglet crisis? Uh, ag huh? Aglets? Aglets. Aglets, maybe. Yeah. Makes aglets? Okay, <laughs> do you ever like have a plastic aglet and like you chew on it and then it falls apart? Wait, tell and... people what an aglet is first. I they know. know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, they know. Does that have to do with it's, Felicia? It's um, aglet is, no it has nothing. It's the aglet is like the thing oh. in your shoe. Oh yeah. You chew on your shoelace? No. <laughs> But sometimes they're on your sweater, like the little drawstring, yeah. and you chew on it because you're just like thinking or something. <laughs> and you're chewing on it, and it falls off, and then it's frayed, and then say like your drawstring falls out, and you have to restring it, and you can't because the end is frayed. 
What is the machine? Glad you could be here, man. Glad you made it to the panel. So, <laughs> so my machine is uh, we'll solve that. <laughs> Very good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Besides Justice and Nat, are there any other intercast romances that fans should start immediately overanalyzing on Tumblr? Not going near that one. Can yeah, I mean, me? we really, I don't think we can say, talk about that, can we? What is it? I didn't hear the question. <laughs> I think that means that there is, and you just can't talk about it. I don't think we can. I don't think we should talk about it. I'm panicking because I didn't hear the question. <laughs> it's like shipping. Is like shipping. Yeah, exactly. Is is oh, like, oh, just like, like on character the cast shipping. Ship people. Yeah. On oh yeah. yeah. Exactly I have a character right ship. Oh, I thought you meant real people. Oh, ship people. Oh, anybody have? Yeah, character ship. Like you. Yeah. Did anybody here drive a minivan in high school? And how is that working out for you today? I drove a minivan in high school, so and I wanted I. to buy a minivan. I didn't have a license. I I have have a Aren't they great? They are great. They're amazing. You can put all your friends in that. I know. I'm so. I want to get a minivan, and Sarah says that it's an old man car. <laughs> <laughs> does a Volvo station wagon count, or doesn't? No, that's not a minivan. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus. Sorry. Um. What is the weirdest question that a fan has asked uh, you guys on social media? <laughs> Uh, when now nah, Justice was cast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, because it's also the weirdest question you've probably ever been asked. When Justice was cast, there's, all, there's another person named Justice Smith who's a 43 year old former American gladiator, <laughs> and he's six foot nine and weighs like 320 pounds. He was pounds. in Thor. Huh? Yeah, he, he was, was in, in Thor. Thor. He was in Thor. And a lot of people were really mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> because they thought I cast the movie. I didn't. I didn't cast the movie. I don't choose to cast. But also, that 43-year-old former American gladiator is not the same Justice Smith as the one who's playing Radar. And they need not have panicked. <laughs> <laughs> so they were just like, why did you cast this huge middle-aged man <laughs> to play my favorite character in your book? And I was like... You just said Jake did it. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's Jake's fault. Yeah. Same way I say with everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Isn't that how you deal with that? Yeah. Totally. In the last chapter of the book, Q comes to the realization after finding Margot leading a sort of erratic, unsanitary life in New York. He <laughs> says, what a treacherous thing it is to believe that a person is more than a person. Would you perhaps say that Quentin's unreal unrealistic idea of Margot makes her a paper person? To him, I think that, yeah, he doesn't do a good job of, exactly, he doesn't do a good job of imagining her complexly and seeing that she is a rich, full, complex person, exactly, yeah. I've been stalking all of you on social media. Thanks. <laughs> and it just looked like so much fun to film this movie. It really, truly yeah. looked like summer camp. Yeah, you guys yeah. except that it was that? super cold. Otherwise, it was entirely like... Yeah. Very cold camp. Freezing yeah. summer camp. <laughs> I even saw some cornhole going on in There's the back. So much cornhole. What was the most? <laughs> That's, a That's a game. <laughs> <laughs> they play it in North Carolina. I don't know. It's <laughs> popular in the American South and Midwest. What was the favorite pastime of the cast to do when you weren't filming? Cornhole, Halo. 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 Singing uh, Taylor Swift. There's a lot of Taylor oh, Swift yeah. singing. Yeah. Yeah. 1989. Uh, human. Human, the killers. Human. Are we human or are we dancer? They sang that song. <laughs> oh, it was my like God. the trips theme song. It's a great song. We all went to a water park oh, one yeah. day. I was in the middle of a scene with Kara, and we're doing this kind of dramatic scene, and <laughs> there's a tear rolling down her face, and then she's just like, Is that a water slide? <laughs> it just turns away from going, Is that a water slide? We gotta get that water slide. And they're like, Kara, we're filming. We're doing <laughs> um, Which is, uh, so then, I didn't hear about it for like another day, and then like two days go by, and Carl's like, I got water slide tickets for everybody. <laughs> in a hotel room. So we all stayed in a hotel room. And but then it's we went not water just sliding. a water slide park, oh. it's like a themed fantasy hotel. Yeah, it's Great, Great Wolf, Wolf Lodge. Lodge. Yeah. The Great yeah. Wolf Lodge. Yeah. Shout out to Great Wolf Lodge. Woo! Yeah. It's like an evil wolf. We were honestly 10 years older than anyone else there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I've I, got... It's fun for families. It is fun for They didn't even pay me to say that. It's no. true, though. Great Wolf Lodge. I've got one last question before we take some questions from the fans. Uh, John, in a recent vlog, you said that you loved the Goonies novelizations, especially as a young child I or did. teenager. 
Um, and oh. for those of you who don't know, it's essentially a book written about the movie after the movie has already come out. If Paper Towns had a novelization, <laughs> would Margot and Q, a year from when the ending takes place, oh wow, would they be dating? Oh <laughs> man, that's a that I have to say that is a yep brilliant <laughs> approach to try to get me to answer that question. <laughs> I that's. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Books belong to their readers. And, uh, <laughs> I, I don't like to assume what happens to a character after the novel ends. They belong to their readers. They belong to all of you. So whatever you think happens, happens. <laughs> they don't belong to me anymore. Uh, I got you, John. <laughs> oh, um, I love you, Nat. Really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh. <laughs> so that. So let's take, some <laughs> let's take some questions from the readers. Hi, I'm Amanda. So I was I watched John your uh, keynote Hello. speech at VidCon, and you talked a lot about how the content you and your brother produ produce is mainly put out there to benefit the community. Mm -hmm. So what was the community like filming Paper Towns? And I assume it was really great. So could you? Uh, I wrote this down. Um, what do you or anybody else on stage believe are the important aspects that help the Paper Towns community, well, the cast and crew, flourish? That's a great question. I mean, I think the, the most important thing was Jake. Uh, Jake set the tone and you know, built the cast and got them there early um, to spend time together, to watch movies together, to kind of uh, form a really intense bond even before shooting started, and I think that was the that was probably the most important thing in having that that community. And it was just sort of built in for me once I showed up. That uh, that's very sweet of John to say, but I, I think the the truth is, I mean, I don't know that I've ever been involved in a project on any level, whether it was a film or not, where I just felt like everyone was so in it for the right reasons. We had great producers on this film, Wick and Marty and Isaac, who have took did fault in our stars and really care about John's work and John just wanting it to be a great movie that was distinct and separate from his books and the cast was incredible. I mean everyone involved in it just wanted it to be great and everyone was willing to work as hard as they possibly could just to make that happen. Like there were no other agendas involved. Everyone just wanted something great out of it and something that could live up to John's book. And I think when everyone's in like that, like it's not hard to, you know, like you can focus on what's important. Thank you. Hi, so uh, I'm Katie, and I was Can we wondering... turn the lights up a little bit in the audience so we can <laughs> oh, see you guys? Like Jake's lighting. <laughs> Put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, especially, uh, I was wondering, we see especially in Paper Towns that Q has these, this flawed vision of Margot, and I was wondering, does it ever bother you when people take Q's thoughts or the quotes from your book out of context and then attribute them to you personally? That's a really good question, and I would like to say that I'm like uh, that it doesn't bother me because I'm a good person or whatever. <laughs> but it does. It does bother me a lot. Uh, it bothers me a lot. It bothers me a lot when people quote that quote from *Abundance of Catherines* about how like there's no point to living an unextraordinary life, which is the exact opposite of what I believe to be true and what I think the kid comes around to at the end of the. Um, at the end of the novel, it does bother me. But I also think, look, I mean, books do belong to their readers. Um, and like, if pe people can take, you know, like I can't, I, anytime I'm trying to like impose my ownership over the story, like I'm not doing myself or the readers of the book any favors. So, you know, I need to let it go out in the world and do what it's gonna do and, um, and mean what it's gonna mean to people. So I have to try to let that go. I don't always do a good job of that. Big line. Yeah. I'm really sorry to say this, but we only have time for two more questions. No! <laughs> Look at all these people lined up. <laughs> About 80. <laughs> I'm just relaying the message. I'm sorry, everyone. Just shout the all at once. Shout yeah, just like the, everyone at the same time. Justice will say it at the, at the same time. Yes! No! Yes! <laughs> yes! Sunday! Monday! Sunday! <laughs> <laughs>
I didn't mean that we so should actually mention count. that as a system. That was pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, let's try the strategy where we do the questions. Let's try uh, sorry, sorry. Hi, I'm yeah, Jenna. Go uh, my question is for John. I'm a really big fan of your writing. And uh, as a writer myself, I'm just wondering what your writing process is like, and probably especially for Paper Towns, and if any of your books came more easily to you than others. Uh, parts of Paper Towns came quickly, but parts came very, very slowly. I mean, the original ending of this book we, like, took place in, the, in uh, Kashmir, um, and there was an earthquake, and uh, it was very bad. Uh, so it took a lot of years before I got away from my Kashmir earthquake idea and came around to Agla, New York. Um, but the, 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 the process for writing this book and for most of my stories is that I tend to write in the morning um, until I'm tired and then I go to work, go to like work in the office and work on Crash Course and other stuff. Um, and thanks. Thank you. Um, and um, so yeah, I, I, I try to write in the morning and then go into the office and do my like regular day job in the afternoon. Um, this Paper Towns in particular was written almost entirely uh, sitting at a table uh, across the um, across from my friend Maureen Johnson, um, who uh, is a great YA writer, and, um, and also uh, Emily Jenkins, E. Lockhart, and uh, Scott Westerfeld. So the four of us would write together, and that was a really special, it's a special time, special memory of writing that story and having these amazing writers to be able to talk to. Let's go over here. Hi, I'm Jen. This is my friend Jason. Hi, um, Jason. Hi. 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 Anyways. This is my question for John. You mentioned earlier um, that you learned a lot of things about different characters in the book um, from the performances. So what was the most unexpected thing that you learned? And that could be opened up to other people, too. I love your shirt. Thank you so much. It says, much. Daisy Buchanan thinks you're a beautiful fool. <laughs> um, um, it's a Gatsby joke. Uh, um, I mean, so, OK, I guess the best example. Like, the character Angela is a lot bigger in the movie than she is in, in the book and, and like much better and more interesting because Jazz Sinclair like brought that character to life so much that she's just really, really interesting to me. Um, and so that's probably the best example. Um, but also like uh, Lacey, uh, who's played by Halston Sage, um, I think did, she did a wonderful job of taking this girl who you think you know because you think you know about blonde white girls in their Starbucks, you know? Like, yeah, you think you've got, you think you've kind of got it, and then she problematizes a lot of those ideas, and I thought that was really interesting. I love the way that she played that character. So those are the two that come to mind. I don't know about you guys. Well, I, I mean, I think what's, what was fun about the movie, like talking about, I forget who asked about it being a, you know, does that make Margot a paper person or the way that she's been objectified? I think what's fun about the journey is that every single character has a way that they're viewed in the beginning and then a way that you come to understand them at the end and they all go on an arc and that we had room in the movie, you know, and that's something that was just, I don't know how they fit all that in the script where we had to trim things, but that, that every single character got to have that arc of the way that they were seen and the way, even that they saw themselves in the beginning of the film and then the way that they not only understood themselves but the other people around them at the end, every single character gets to have that journey. Cool. That's a good point. I'm so yeah, you can bring it up afterwards. Guys, I'm so sorry that we're out of time, One out more. Of time for questions. One more. One more. No. Nat insists. Let's, the girl with the jean jacket. Last question. Let's do a Hunger Games competition. Shout it. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Lisa. Um, I'm a middle school English teacher, and my question is for you. Um, Oh man, the most important message I would send to young people in today's world. Jeez. Go. <laughs> go naked this. under your graduation gift. Yeah, well, yeah, go uh, naked under your graduation uh, robes. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess that um, uh, there's Robert Frost uh, once said the thing that I try to hold and uh, at all times that I find helpful. Robert Frost once said that the only way out is through. And um, you can be inside of things that uh, feel intractable or feel unconquerable or feel unsurvivable, but they aren't. Um, there, there is a way, there is a way through and there is a path through, um, and that doesn't mean that it'll be easy um, or that it will be painless, but there is a way through. Um, 
So when it comes to learning or when it comes to writing or when it comes to uh, my friendships, um, I, I try to remember that. That's great. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.